All right, I'm gonna try and jump into this quickly. Um, I'll say this, I think this solution, is, or 2.3 is graded. I checked it a little earlier when I made this announcement slide. I think it was still being graded at the time, but I think it is graded. I know attendance grades uh, should be current, so we're just rocking and rolling. Everything go well with the homework, just the, this last homework. Everybody get the hint? The idea is that the kilograms needed to be multiplied by 9.81 meters per second squared to turn it into a force. Remember, we deal with forces, not the masses. So everybody's like, did I do that? It's not a big deal. All right. Okay, um, today what we're going to do is we're going to do a further example with 2D equilibrium, but I, I'm going to make a point with this example about strategy. Um, the last example was, a, a, and the last homework was a very, I guess, um, general strategy. In other words, just write your sum of forces in the x direction, write your sum of forces in the y direction, write those two equations, and then two by two system of equations. Um, a lot of times in this, uh, not just in this class, but just in engineering in general, um, the order in which you solve the equations can make your life a little easier, okay? Um, and that'll become clear when we do this problem, uh, this additional example. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about is examples involving pulleys. Um, there is a, a, an additional example, bless you, at the, uh, at the end of this lecture, which I may not do in class because... I'm giving you a homework assignment that's a little bit on the tricky side, and I want to talk about a hint for that assignment that will make your life a little easier. And I'd rather take the time to talk about that than this in-class example, because I think the in-class example at the end is actually easier. So I'd rather focus on the tricky stuff. Was that? Okay. I did, everybody else heard that too, right? Okay. What's that? Laugh real. Everybody laughing at my lecture. That's what it is. Okay. Um, all right, let's jump into it. So last time we had done problems that uh, involved the um, uh, application of static equilibrium. So we finally started applying the statics, you know, let seven lectures in. But the idea is that, you know, the first thing that we did after a little bit of math and physics review is we started learning about vectors and how to add vectors that all meet at a common point. And so the simplest way of doing that is to write vectors in ij notation and then add up the x components and add up the y components. Uh, and that's how you add vectors. And what I propose is that um, if we want a situation to be in static equilibrium, then the resultant vector must be zero. The sum of those vectors must be the zero vector. Uh, and so what that yields is two equations that we must solve. Sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction. Okay. Um, and then don't forget acceleration due to gravity if you ever need to take a mass and multiply it by either 9.81 meters per second squared in SI or 32.2 feet per second squared in US units. Okay. Um, what we did last time was we just sort of applied each equation and, and yielded a two by two system of equations which we needed to you know, use matrix algebra and all that to solve. Maybe we don't need to do that every time. And, and I'll show you that with this, okay? So um, I have uh, a problem which has more forces going on. I've got a, uh, a sort of a boat in a, um, in a sort of channel or a canal, and I have a drag force that's you know, being applied to the um, uh, boat because of the flow in the river or the flow in the canal. And um, I have a series of cables that are keeping the, uh, the boat in equilibrium, in static equilibrium. Now, I know the tensile force in two of these cables. I know the tensile force in cable AB. I know the tensile force in cable AC. So based on that, what I want to know is what's the tensile force in the remaining cable, and I actually want to know what that drag force is. So the idea is maybe we can use the readings on those two cables to figure out how much drag is being exerted uh, on the boat. Okay? So our free body diagram is basically going to be uh, uh, revolved around point A because all the forces are all flowing through point A. So what we'll do is we'll write um, a free body diagram and we'll describe some vectors and let's see if we can apply our equations of equilibrium in maybe a bit of a strategic uh, fashion in order to, um, to, to solve this problem. So here we go. Uh, let me make that a little bigger. Okay. All right. So first off, let's, um, let's draw a free body diagram. Let me get my little pen out here. 
Don't fall. Sit there. Okay. So um, let's do our free body diagram first. Okay. Um, and we have a series of forces that are, that are uh, uh, being applied through this point, okay? And let me see if I can write these out. So I'll try and, whoop, I will try and be um, somewhat neat with this. Let me move this down a little bit. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this force like this. We'll call this tension AE, okay? And then we'll write this force right here tension AD. Sorry, AB. Okay? And um, what I'll do is the other two forces, what I'll do is I'll write this one as tension AC, and I'll write this one as my drag force as FD, <coughs> so the force sub D, drag force, okay? All right, now uh, one thing I am going to point out is some angles here. So let's start off with this angle here on the left, okay? Now what we're given is this right here, we're given this term as alpha. Um, if this is alpha, what is this? 90 degrees minus alpha, okay. And if this is beta, what is this angle? There you go. Okay, so just to make sure that our bookkeeping is appropriate. Okay? So far so good? All right. So that's our free body diagram. Maybe I'll take this diagram and move it up a little bit just to make my calcs a bit neater. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to approach this problem the same way I did the last time. Uh, I'm going to describe my vectors. Okay. So let's describe our vectors and let's do it in order, okay? Let's do it in alphabetical order, just the, the way that we've been doing it. Uh, up to this time. By the way, um, what were we given in terms of magnitudes at the beginning of the problem? I'll say note. We were given TAB and TAE, right? That we were given. So TAB or the magnitude of vector TAB is 40 pounds. Maybe I'll do that. We are given this one. This one was 60. Okay. So far so good? All right, so let's do this, um, let's do this in order. Let's start off with vector AB. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do with vector AB um, is I'm going to try and figure out what alpha is, okay? So the one thing I know about uh, alpha, so let me go up a little bit. Um, I know that for alpha, I know that here's my triangle.
and this is alpha, and I'm given that this is seven feet, and this is four feet. Does everybody see that? So if I wanted to just solve for alpha, how would I get alpha? Well, is there any trig function I can define with alpha using these legs of the triangle? Which one is that? Tangent, right? So we know that the tangent of alpha is the opposite over the hypotenuse, right? Or sorry, over the adjacent. So therefore, alpha is the arc tangent or the inverse tangent of 7 over 4. And in degrees, we'll say two decimal places, what is that? Say it again. 61.93. Um, do I have a second on that? I got a little bit of a different answer. I got 60.26. Did I do something wrong? 60.26? Check, check the mode. Or 60. I got, yeah, I got 60.26. And most people are getting that? Something like that. But you're getting something very different, right? I don't know. You might want to check. So, okay. Okay. I, I think we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's alpha, but we need 90 minus alpha. So 90 minus alpha is 90 minus 60.26, which I'm getting uh, 29.74. Is that right? Okay. So if I, um, if I want to describe vector AB, okay, so how do I describe vector AB? It is a pile of junk times I plus a pile of junk times J, okay? So inside here and here, I need the magnitude and I need cosine and sine, right? So what's the magnitude again of vector AB? 40. So I'm going to have... I'm going to have a cosine I'm going to have that and is there anything you can tell me about the signs? The first one's negative, the second one's positive. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Okay, so this is what times I? What goes in here? We'll say two decimal places. I'm getting like 34 something. Anybody else getting that? 34.73. I'm seeing a second. So 34. And then I'll go ahead and do the next one. I'm getting um, 1985. Everybody right? With, okay with that? Okay. So this is TAB. Now notice TAB, I've got numbers, okay? Because I was given the magnitude of TAB at the beginning of the problem, okay? TAC, that's not going to be the case. TAC, I better have a variable answer in there because TAC is an unknown. So far so good? So same process as before with TAC, okay? Um, but before we move on to TAC, I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with what I did with TAB. Am I good? Okay. So with TAB, or sorry, TAC, um, I'm going to sort of go through the same process. All right? This was 
four feet, this is 1.5 feet, and what we're interested in, at least from our schematic, is that angle beta. So just like before, here I'll draw a quick little line through here to sort of separate what I did before. So I know that the tangent of beta is 1.5 feet over 4 feet. So therefore, beta is the inverse tangent. We got a value for me on that? Twenty point five six. Second. Okay. Just like before, we're going to do a ninety minus beta because both these angles were referenced off the vertical, not the horizontal. All right, and so that's sixty nine point forty four. Okay. And so TAC is, and, and here's all I'm going to do for TAC. First off, what quadrant is TAC in? So they're both positive, right? So all I'm going to do for TAC is I'm just going to say TAC cosine 69.44 times I, bless you, plus TAC sine times J. I'm just going to leave the sines and cosines. I'm not going to worry about anything else. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Now, the big thing, here's something that's really easy to forget when you're doing these problems. It's easy when you write these to forget the magnitude. The magnitude's there too. If you leave the magnitude out, all you're saying is TAC is a vector with a length of one without any magnitude. So don't forget the magnitude. Okay. So far so good? All right, so somebody help me out with the others. So how do we describe vector AE? And just to re recap or refresh everybody, AE is this one. So what is the description for vector AE? What's that? Well, it, it's, we're looking at, a, so I, I think I see what you're saying. It's not really vertical because it's just going along the river, but it is in the y-axis, right? So I, let me ask you this way. What if it's something times i plus something times j, what's times i? Zero. Zero. What's times j? Negative 60. Negative 60, right? Not 60, negative 60 because it's going down, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so... So that means this one... And then, what's our drag vector? What's it going to be? FD, and, and, but if it's FD equals, bless you, something times I plus something times J, what's times J? Zero. And so, what's times I is whatever the magnitude is. We don't know what the magnitude is, right? So the magnitude is unknown. So this is FD. Th does that make sense? So these are our four vectors, okay? All right. Let's take a step back and make sure we're all comfortable with what we've done so far. Is everybody okay with this? Can you explain the drag part? So, no, that's fine. So the drag vector is this one over here, okay? So it only has a component in the x direction. So the y component is zero. As for how much that magnitude is in the x direction, we don't know. That's actually one of the purposes of the problem is to figure that out. So we'll say it's some variable times i plus nothing times j. Is there, yes? So that's, that's a fair point. Um, 
basically what I'm trying to do for this problem is, so I got this problem out of the book, and, and the problem in the book was using these terms alpha and beta. So the point I want to make is, okay, we all agree that that's alpha, right? That's alpha, okay? Um, so once we agree that that's alpha, let, let, we'll, we'll get that out of the way first. Um, alpha is 60.26, okay? Now, most um, engineering students are usually familiar with cosine and sine being associated with x and y, right? So the cosine is related to the x-axis, the sine is related to the y-axis, right? But the only way that works is if the angle is off the horizontal, right? So what I'm doing here is saying if I want to use cosine with x and sine with y, the angle needs to be off the horizontal. So one way of thinking about it is I could have sine of 60.26 and cosine of 60.26, and that give you the same answer. But I think it's, you know, it, most, my, my experience, most engineering students, cosine x, sine y, just get the angle off the horizontal. That's usually sort of my, my suggestion with that. So. Does that make sense? That's a good question. But we also did 90 minus. Okay. Yeah, we did that one too. We did it the same way. So we calculated this angle beta right here was like 20 something, but we used 90 minus in the sine and cosine. That, fair question. Don't hesitate on that. Everybody, everybody else, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. All right, we've got a lot of vectors here, so I know this might seem uh, tedious, but I want to summarize these vectors again. So, and there's a reason why. That is a mess. Okay. That's E. Okay. I'm, I'm writing it like, if you remember that last example, we sort of did them again and we wrote them in like that, that sort of columnar fashion. So I'm going to do the same thing. And then, so let, let's fill these in. So TAB, this was negative. That. This one was this one was zero and this one was FD. Did I get that right? Okay. Now we've got this, this, this. Okay, we got 1985. This one we've got negative 60 and zero. Okay, did I get that right? Did I miss anything? I think I got it right. Now, Static equilibrium says sum of forces in the x direction must be zero and sum of forces in the y direction must be zero. So let me just ask a mechanical question. How do I sum forces in the x direction? How do I do that? Add up all of this, right? This is all the sum of the forces in the x direction. So, would you agree that this little red box is the sum of the forces in the x direction, right? And that this little blue box right here is the sum of the forces in the y direction. Everybody in agreement? Now, how did we do this last time? We said, okay, let's 
do this one, do this one. The F right here? No, because that's this force right here pointing to the right, so it's positive. Yeah, that's a good question. All right. Okay, so how did we do this last time? Last time we said, okay, let's sum up everything here, sum up everything here, throw it into our Casio FX 115 ES plus little matrix sum over and get an answer. Will that work here? Yes, that will work here. But we can do this a lot easier. Okay. Let me ask you a question. How many variables are in the red box? Two, TAC and FD, right? How many variables are in the blue box? Why don't we do the blue box first? Let's see what happens. So, so what do I get? I get 19.85. So is there anything stopping me from just solving for TAC just right now? No need for fancy equation solvers, just do it. Maybe what I'll do is I'll say, therefore, how do we solve for TAC? Take the 60 pounds, move it over here. Take the 1985, move it over here. Divide both sides by that. So 60 So see what I'm getting at? Be strategic. Do this one first. Do the sum of the forces in the y direction first. That idea, by the way, of being strategic about which equation of equilibrium you apply in which order will be very important for later problems throughout the semester. So I want to plant that idea in your head now. What do we get for this? A second? Okay. So now let's sum forces in the x direction. And if we do that, we get We get that, right? Um, okay. So we have two unknowns, but don't we know one of them? We know one. We know TAC. So now we can just solve for FD directly, right? Take this, move it on over, take that, move it on over. And what do we get? We get FD. Oh, that's a cosine. And what do we get? Uh, 19.67. Second. And sirs, I guess I should say.
So the problem asked, what are the two forces required to keep the boat in equilibrium? There's your answer, but you don't have to apply that matrix solution. To be clear, that matrix solution strategy will work for really any problem that we do, but um, we can be crafty, if you were, in the way that we solve our problems, okay? And that quote-unquote craftiness will become uh, maybe a little important on the homework, that there's easier ways of doing it. Yes. would be the order in which you write them. So, so what I would do here, that's a great question. And this would be the way I would answer it. What I would do is I would take, for example, this equation, right? Write it with FD first and then TAC, right? Then take this one, write it with FD first. So FD is going to be zero and then TAC, right? Does that make sense? So for this one, move, take TAC on the, on the left, take everything else, move it to the right. This equation, put FD first, then TAC, move everything else to the right. Plug it in that way. And just do it alphabetically. That's the easiest way to handle it. And then whatever the answer is uh, for X, that's your first term, in this case FD. Whatever your answer is for the second one is that one. That, that's how I would do it. The calculator is just basically going to respect whatever order you put them in. Just make sure that with both equations you put them in the same order. That's a good question. Does that make sense? Everybody good so far? Okay. All right. Okay. Good to go? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about pulley problems. Um, pulley problems are common in an engineering 213 statics class, and they're mainly meant to sort of just um, get you thinking in the in the right mindset, as it were, for, um, for the types of, of, of analyses that we're going to do throughout the semester. Um, the idea is usually like to figure out the, the required amount of tension uh, in the cable to keep a box uh, in stable equilibrium. And so the idea is, okay, I have like a pretty simple scenario here. What if I take the simple scenario and make it not so simple, okay? How many, uh, uh, what would be the tensile force uh, in each cable? Um, it's not very difficult to solve um, if you utilize a secret weapon of engineering. Our secret weapon of engineering is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. Um, so the idea is how many cuts through the rope do you have to do in order to um, uh, achieve equilibrium? Uh, or in order to, not in order to achieve equilibrium, sorry. The idea is how many cuts do you have to make to fully sever the box, as it were, and make it fall down. So to give you kind of an idea of what I'm talking about, um, so I think I put this in the notebook. So like the idea is like if I had this box here and the box weighs 600 pounds, determine the tension in the cable um, for each of these two scenarios, right? So like the idea here on the left, okay? So what's happening here on the left is I have a 600 pound force that's acting downward, okay? And so if I break out my secret weapon of structural engineering, which is the samurai sword or the lightsaber, if I happen to be a sci-fi fan and I cut through these, what I'm getting essentially is a free body diagram that looks sort of like this. I've got my pulley, I've got my 600 pounds, and then I'm cutting through the rope, and I'm essentially cutting through it twice. Does everybody see that? So what's happening is I'm getting two forces that are going upwards, right? But the thing is, is that it's a rope, okay? So the tensile force is consistent throughout the entirety of the rope. So like if I give you one end of a rope and I have the rope and we're applying a tension, it's the same tension everywhere throughout the rope. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is I have one T going up, but I also have another T going up, okay? So if I have 600 pounds going down, what does T have to be to keep the structure in equilibrium? 300 pounds, does everybody see that? Because I have 600 down, I have 2T going up. So if you wanted to be formal about it, you could say, okay, I'm going to sum forces in the Y direction. Maybe we'll take all of our upward forces to be positive. 
and we'll say 2t minus 600 is 0. So t is 300 pounds. D does that make sense? So if that's the case, and if that makes sense, what do you think t is for this scenario here on the right? If it's 300 pounds on the left, what is it on the right? 200 pounds. Exactly right, right? Because over here, I've got this scenario here. And then I've got, but I also have that. So I've got T, T, T. So in this case, basically what the pulleys are serving to do is sort of loop the rope around again so the rope is acting more efficiently, I guess is the best way of putting it. Does that make sense? That shouldn't be all that challenging. Okay? So far so good? All right. Um, so here's, here's what I think we're going to do. I have, um, I'll, t I'll tell you what I have here in my slides. I have an additional example which I could do, and, and I will probably put this in the class notebook just so that you have it for reference, but I don't think this would be as valuable as reviewing something about the homework problem you all are about to have, because I think that one's going to be a little on the tricky side, and I'd rather go through that, because I think you'll find that hint a little bit more uh, useful, okay? So, everybody good with that? Okay, so like I said, I'll do this problem and just put it in the notebook, but let's talk about the homework problem, okay? So this is going to be the homework problem that I am giving you all in, uh, in class, and, or in, in homework due Monday, and the goal of the homework is to figure out what P and alpha need to be in order to keep the system in equilibrium, okay? So you've got to figure out P and alpha, okay? So it's a little different than, than the problem we just did, but not really in terms of the fact that there are, um, I saw some pictures I can pose. It's a joke, not very funny. I gotta have fun with it, it's right. Okay, um, so the idea is to figure out P and alpha, which again, it's a little different than what we did before, but there are two equations of equilibrium and there are two unknown quantities, P and alpha. So maybe a little bit different on the math side, but not really, really different from a conceptual side. First off, by the way, what do we do with that? 9.81 to convert a mass to a, uh, uh, to a weight. Okay, so here's my hint, okay? My hint is the free body diagram, okay? All right. First off, okay, before we draw that, okay, so I'm going to look at this triangle right here, which is 2.4 meters and seven or 0 0.75 meters right here. I'm drawing that as an exponent. Let me stop that. I have a habit of doing that sometimes. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm looking at like this triangle right here, right? Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this angle as beta. Now I'm not going to tell you how to calculate beta. I'm pretty sure y'all can figure that out, right? But I'm just, but the reason I say that is because I'm going to use beta in my free body diagram here in a little bit. Okay. Now, my free body diagram, sorry, I'm going to change this real quick. My free body diagram is going to be of point A, okay? Because point A is where all of the um, forces are going through, okay? And so let's look at point A. All right. Um, 
Now point A, first off, there is a force that we know, okay? And that is a downward force, which I will call the weight, okay? And what I will say for the weight it is, is it is zero I plus negative MGJ. Is, is that okay? I think everybody's okay with that. Next, we have a force here. I'm going to call that force here alpha, or at an angle alpha. I'm going to call it vector P. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? But there's also a force going up. Now here's the thing, this is really the, the, the crux of the hint, okay? This force is going up like this. It's at an angle of what? What's that angle going to be? Beta. But here's the kicker, what's the magnitude of that force? If you were paying attention to my pulley problems, take a look at this rope how this rope goes. What is the magnitude of this force going up? It's going to be 2p. It's 2p because there's two ropes going through here. Admittedly, this diagram is a little confusing, bless you, because you would think both of these kind of need to go through the pulley, and, and they are kind of going through the pulley. For the purposes of the problem, you can assume that the pulley's size is negligible. They're draw, they, they need to draw the pulley with some dimension so that you can kind of see that this is the same rope. But the idea is that this rope goes all the way like that. So if you cut, you're getting one, two piece pulling up like that. So what I'm saying is describe vector P, right? Two P of that vector is going this way. Same unknown quantities, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So describe a vector going like this with a magnitude of P. Describe a vector like that with a magnitude of 2P. That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? I think that will help. I think that will help far more than me going through example three together. Questions? Well then. If nobody has any questions, I'm going to give you eight minutes of your life back. I'm going to pull up the code one more time. But that's all I have, everybody. Y'all have a wonderful weekend.